Well, if you want to make life difficult for yourself, try to pick the best E classes across generations because, as I've found out, there are so many variations to each and every single type of engine, variation, and chassis design. So, I'm going to try and go through them as quickly as I can and highlight the ones that I think are going to be the picks for you. But what I will just mention first off is that we're going to be covering the W124 generation first. Now, I know these are essentially in the classic car territory by now. So, what I'm going to say is that there is a difference at this age in sort of actual speed and performance of engines. When you get to newer cars, we can talk more about reliability and you know how they function day to day and which one's sort of a bit faster than the other one. In this generation though, it's a little bit more difficult because some of them are slow. Now that might be okay for you, but I'm going to recommend the ones that are a little bit quicker just so in modern traffic, you don't feel like you're always sort of chasing down the car in front. Um, so if you want a diesel, um, it's just the 300D. That was the one that I would pick out. And it's mainly because if you go for anything sort of um, at the lowest weight, like the 200, it, it will feel like you are in a bit of an uphill battle. It's just that era of diesels where they're just still getting the technology right, getting the, the acceleration, the performance out of the engine was still a challenge. If we step over to the petrols, you've got the uh, M110 and M111 engine. Um, as far I've made a quick note on this, so that's you can go for the 300E. There's a 300E 24 valve, there's a 2.6, I think it's either a 3 litre or 3.2. Uh, I'm trying to keep all this in my mind. So, with this generation, I'm sure you'll know because you're probably enthusiastic of that, um, of that particular brand if you're watching the video for these classic ones. But that engine, it's a good performer, it's well built, it's rugged. When you get to the larger sort of the, the 320 um, end of it, they can just be a little bit more, I wouldn't say delicate, but they may need a little bit more maintenance, that's what I would say. Whereas for example, let's say the, the, the 2.6, that one, be quick enough, reliable, you know, it, it ticks a lot of boxes there. Um, that's not to say, on this particular generation, that if you find one in good condition, it doesn't mean to say you should avoid the rest of the engines. The E36 AMG, that's a pick. That's a real pick. But finding one, finding one that's, let's just say a reasonable amount of money, because I know that will be sort of in the classics era, probably a little bit desirable now, probably sort of inching up in prices, especially over the last five years. So what I would say is if you do find one with a different engine, this is that era of Mercedes cars that are built without the um, the newer concept of planned obsolescence. This is where you have the old way of building cars and new technology meeting, this sort of mid 80s point, where up to this point, so coming up from the 50s, 60s, 70s, 80s, really people are just trying to make cars last as long as they can, which is five or 10 years. You know, they're, they're struggling with rust issues, they're struggling with reliability issues, engines are breaking. That's just the reality if you're buying cars in those early years. All of the classic owners that I used to speak to would make a joke that these are classics now, so you forgive them for everything. But back when they were younger and these were actually their cars, half the time they just couldn't wait for the next car to come out because they were just always sort of tinkering and working on them. And if you're into it, that was great. But if you just want to get to your job in the morning, a little bit inconvenient. So good condition ones of these. I probably wouldn't avoid any particular engine. I highlighted the ones that I think are better. But if you find one that's been well cared for, it should be a nice classic to own. The sort of thing that, you know, you can take out on a weekend, take to a car show, and it should just get you there and get you home. And it's still part of the classics world. It won't be probably as desirable as some other classics, but you know you're going to get home. And in the classics world, that's worth a lot. So that ends that one, uh, the W124. Let's move on to W110. This era, this particular E-Class is probably, if you're a Mercedes fan, if you're watching this because you just love everything Mercedes and you're really aware of their sort of history, different cars they've made, this is likely the one that you hold dearest because it's the it, 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 it sort of catches on to the end of what I was talking about there. It's still made to last as long as possible because Mercedes don't know how to make cars in any other way but to exist forever or at 
attempt to exist forever. But this is where you really get the generations of, you know, the best possible materials for longevity and the best possible understanding and design to make them actually achieve it. And so the the is there engines? Yeah, there's certain engines I would pick. Um, if you're going again, uh, diesel, um, these may, depending on where you are in the world. So some countries, I'm going to speak to the UK just for a second. We have a rule of 40 years, which means after 40 years, a car officially becomes a historic vehicle and it becomes, it goes into a segment called historic vehicle tax, historic, historic vehicle. It has something put on the V5, which I'm tempted to say is historic vehicle, but it may be classed as something else. Um, but what that basically does is it exempts it of, of its yearly annual uh, MOT, so it's, it's sort of safety check of everything. It exempts it of road tax critically um, because you, know, you can sort of keep it in the garage for free then and just drive it whenever you want. You still have to tax it, but it's free. And you can drive it into all the cities across you know, the country and, and wherever there might be restrictions, and they are exempt from those restrictions. Now, if it's a, a charging zone for congestion, I'm not 100% sure. I think like the London congestion zone, you may still pay, but I could be wrong on that one. Um, but yeah, the 40-year rule, it really does play into a lot of owners of these older cars because it means you can go to that car show and not worry about, oh, am I going to have to cover emissions? When you get into this generation, these are still a little bit too new. And so for the diesel engines, they will probably face a lot of the restrictions that I used to see uh, classic car owners selling for, you know, especially those who lived in the sort of boroughs around London and sort of within London who are going to be in the taxing zones. And I think that's gone out to different parts of the UK now, but it they will affect European cities. And as we move on in time, I'm sure uh, lots of parts of the world. So in this generation, you can go for the diesel. They sell the um, 300 or 3000. I've got to get that right. I'm pretty sure it's the 300. Give me a second. I actually had to click on Wikipedia there for a second just to trust them. So if I'm wrong here, well, it's Wikipedia's fault because I just needed something to check really quickly. It's 300. So they still sell the 300D in the early production. That will pretty much last as long as it's maintained um, in perpetuity. We're really just these engines that they're built of that era. When you move to the 320 CDI, they're also in, in a bracket where they... Um, if you look at their start here in this in this generation e-class they they do carry on for quite a long time around about 15 years of lifespan and in that time they have to have a lot of emissions equipment put on them and other things that restrict their performance and their ability to breathe and all this other stuff as we learn you know exactly about emissions and the way of emissions and uh, control however when they come into this generation those uh, emission controls don't really exist i'm just trying to think the next generation is 02 so yeah, you might find some of the 2001s, maybe. Um, no, they'll just have catalytic converters. They won't have DPS or anything like that. So a lot of the emissions issues that these cars, uh, this engine faces in later cars, it won't face on that generation. So if you would like a diesel that has a little bit more modern, modern performance, more modern fuel economy, and will still go um, you know, really well just around town, it won't have the clatter of something that maybe sounds like it belongs in a G-Wagon then uh, yeah the 320 cdi if it's a petrol boy you've got some good choices here um i would look at the v8 because i think from a collector standpoint that that's kind of where these cars are are at and if you go for something like the 240 uh, 280 3 320 sort of petrols the one issue you may face is just the desirability now that's not a problem if you're just buying for what you want just something to enjoy you kind of can accept a bit of maintenance these are better to work on than almost uh, any other generation moving on from that one w w211 so I've, I've, I've recently did the buyer's guide for this one and i've already had a little bit of pushback just because of some of the things i said so i'm going to try and clear it up as best i can if you go for an early car they won't all be bad cars it's just that Mercedes go through a period in the early 2000s which isn't their best of reliability. So that's, you know, 2001, 2, 3, 4, 5, into 6. Once you get to 2007, 2008, Mercedes do reinvest a lot of money into making their cars better. And you see it in reliability scores. You see this sort of prior to that, really good, and then this dip. 
and then they come back up again. So should you be careful of the early cars? Well, common faults are around 1% of production vehicles. So when, you talk, when I talk in that guide about electrical issues and uh, a lot of the sort of chassis issues and some rust issues, that won't be every car. The best thing about that generation in that early segment is that they have really good engines. If your main concern is the engine, then the 02 to 05 into 06, those are the engines to look at because they get pretty much all of the performance that you're going to need on the road today. You're not going to feel slow in traffic in almost any of them. But at the same time, you're going to get reasonably good fuel economy. You know, you're not going to get ancient fuel economy. You're not going to get today's fuel economy, but pretty good. And they can be maintained by yourself uh, at home. The difficulty will be is picking a good one because of the, the rest of the car, essentially. So you're really looking for one with good service history for the rest of the vehicle. Engine wise, though, if it has to be just the most reliable, they do a uh, 240 model. I think it is. Um, uh, it might be the. Um, yeah, and I think a 280 petrol. Those have they're, they're not the biggest seller. But they have pretty much the least reports of any issues. They just seem to just keep going, put fuel in them, put oil in them. That's it. Um, I, I would probably look out a little bit more than that. The diesel, particularly the 220 CDI this generation. It's been used in taxis around Europe um, for years. It is a very reliable engine, very cost effective to run. And on top of all of that, it it has modern day performance. Okay, it's not going to you know drag race against the AMG models, but you can drive it around, clean it up, polish it, and you know what? It, it just has that look that says this is a good, nice car. You know, this is something a little bit luxurious here, but it doesn't have all the running costs of the bigger engines, and you don't face any penalty in reliability for doing so. Now you can look at the 320, then you've got a V6 diesel. You can look at the 2.7. The 2.7, this is fitted to the um, the E270 CDI, has a five-cylinder. Do you know how rare it is to get a five-cylinder engine in anything? A Volvo have it. Um, a few other manufacturers, Audi, have had it over the years. I'm just trying to think if there's anyone else, and I'm, I'm struggling, if I'm honest. Um, so to have a five-cylinder engine at all is, uh, is is a nice sort of little little party trick. A little you know, mention at a car show or whatever. Oh, yeah, I've got a five-cylinder in this. But the V6s do have a bit better sound, and for a diesel engine, they... I remember I ran one of the... Uh, this generation, I think it was about an 06 plate. I had it for about five, six months when I was... Um, what was I doing? I was commuting to another site for the car sales job I was doing at the time. So they gave me one of these, but it was in a C-Class. I remember it performed phenomenally, but what caught me out with it... <laughs> It didn't really sound like a diesel when in the V6 form in the 320s. It 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 went and it had a fairly pleasing sound to it. If you're not a diesel lover, you can go for the 55 AMG if you want performance. The early 500, good runner. Um, the early 400 also a good runner, but you're not going to get a V8. If you want one of the engines that really stand, it will stand out in Mercedes history forever probably it was fitted to the sls that you know, really will sit it out, out as uh, an engine to aspire to have it's the 6.2 v8 fitted in the amg 63 or 63 amg so e63 amg that's built from 2006 um you'll get it on model year i think late 2006 2007 and, and onwards um i've driven that car at uh, mercedes and sounds fantastic but uh, and it performs amazingly. Fuel economy, yeah, it's a pay a price there. The issue is uh, these early ones, I mentioned this in the guide to the W211, is um, until 2000 and I think it's 2011, there is a, a bit of an issue. Um, there, is a, there was a, a, a lawsuit in the US to try and um, get owner's compensation because they felt this was such a common issue. Mercedes should have been aware of it. So that's something to bear in mind. But if it's had the repair done, that's a real great engine, and that really should last and be a classic for, well, in perpetuity, almost. Let's move on to the W212 generation. So this starts in around 2009, 
and it's probably it's probably a moment if we're looking at the modern mercedes now so we've sort of moved out of the w12 uh, w211 generation that was designed in the 90s and early 2000s now we're looking at a car that's designed in this sort of more modern era where you've got a lot of cad design you've got a lot more engineers working with computer um, design and phases and testing and a lot of non-destructive testing or ndt testing so um this is a solid vehicle built to modern standards the downsides emissions equipment will affect the diesels essentially all of the diesel will need emissions equipment replacement at some point in their lives that's a reality of, of the world we live in um they they produce lower uh, nox emissions and everything else because of it but it will be something you'll have to consider if you're looking to buy it and i think if you're watching this video to buy one of these you're probably looking at for your everyday car and i'm still going to suggest the diesel models I, I just think diesel on this engine um i say some emissions things going on but if you can get those repaired fixed or find one that's already had them done that would be the move uh then this is a really good engine now it's something to be aware of that there is a a step change across this generation um it's around 2000 and i think it's 2014 um i'll double check give me a second yeah 2013 production so i was close um, but i wanted to be right and it was worth taking a second just to double check that so the the, the few things it's worth re mentioning here um i'm just going to start with one point which is you can still get the 6.2 v8 on a 63 amg so if you are after this as sort of a bit of a collector or something that you want to keep long term and just enjoy and have as maybe the family car but the second family car the one that you take out when you want to have some fun maybe some of those sort of um, uh, family holidays whatever else but you're not going to drive it every single day because of the fuel economy and maintenance facelift brings in the 5.5 v8 you know what that engine's uh that's it, it the 5.5 brings in turbocharged so there's a transition here happening from having naturally aspirated to turbocharging i'm not going to give a preference because it'll be down to you which way you like power delivered but it's it's a change over time it's the move from mercedes and it's a move from the industry away from big displacement high horsepower to turbocharging maintaining the horsepower but trying to improve efficiency as well um the diesels you have the 350 and uh 300 the 220 220 again look a lot of 220s are sold across the world 2.1 they're very popular engines they are in a lot of taxis okay some taxi owners go for the 350 diesel fair play to them um and the 350s they're never really working as in sorry i don't mean that as in a way of their brake they just never pushed they never need to be they, they such low down torque delivery that if you buy one it will definitely have a long life ahead of it because owners never need to push the engine past say 3000 rpm to really get the best out of it and because of that it should have a lot of longevity but it will again have some emissions equipment issues now if you want more specifics on that there is a guide that i've done to this i'll link all the guides below the video by the way uh, in the comment section so um, there is a guide for the w2 one one w212 and w213 so any of these generations you can check out the full buyer's guide um if you just want one to run around in they do a hybrid and i know some people have views of, of hybrids especially used okay but i've always quite liked hybrids i think they do a great job of um, they remove the most challenging part for any engine which is braking inertia if you look at how fuel economy is 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 really worked and calculated and is affecting an engine uh, the the moving off part zero to ten that's real that's really the challenge once they're up to speed that's where they become most efficient so by removing the zero to ten zero to twenty part by having electrical assistance or running on batteries for that lower speed for the small amount of range you get with a hybrid you know you get higher efficiency you take the load off the engine the engines generally speaking when i'm doing these guides whenever i talk about the hybrids they are lasting the longest engine wise but they can obviously offer up a bill for the electrical system so you know and the batteries and the motors so you know understand pick which one of you want for that one but i'd say if you're buying it from a point of view of something to have something to enjoy 
um, the AMGs um, or as I said the the um, the larger V6 uh, diesel uh, model. Those two, they they're very different, and this diesel engine will have some restrictions on where it can go if you're living in certain countries around Europe, for example, because it uh, the early ones and most of them actually up until. 2013 14 they won't fit the later emissions rules okay so um some of them will but I, i'm just putting some blanket statements on that one so that you know and you can check in advance um there is the 500 of course any 500 it, it becomes a bit rarer in this generation because mercedes bring diesels to more markets um the general idea being that these sort of big talky diesel engines with turbocharging can give similar performance to those big sort of v8 engines uh without having the economy um penalty and because they don't sound as sort of rattly as old diesels people were kind of happy to make that change obviously then that all switches in time because we're about to move on to the period where diesel emissions really start to get clamped down but because of that you have those two extremes you have um, sort of the e500 sitting in the middle but they'll be a bit harder to find on from there, we go to the W213 generation. So thank you, Mercedes, so far for at least making it easy to step through the generations because BMWs are a lot more difficult to remember. So this is now the last sort of... I'm going to say this is the last area where I can really suggest the diesels because it starts to face a few emissions issues. As I say, you can check out the buyer's guide that we've done for this, this particular engine if you're interested, but... If, if it's a car that you're thinking i'm going to own it for four years and over that time i'm willing to sort of make the balance out between reliability and fuel economy because of course the smaller four cylinder diesel it will give you better fuel economy and it will still perform fantastically and over the life of them it's just the chances 95 percent of those smaller diesel engines will probably have no problem whatsoever maybe an emissions uh, equipment failure or something like that that needs replacing which will be a big bill but you've saved a lot of money by having the smaller diesel engine than any other engine in the lineup the v6 diesel again doesn't work as hard that is a pro for longevity of the engine especially if you're looking to not have a three or four year ownership but you're looking at a seven eight nine year ownership however if you are looking at a seven eight nine year ownership you've just got to think of what could be coming down the road for diesel owners i don't know you don't know Seemingly, the rule makers don't seem to know. Maybe it'll be good news. That's not the way things have been going, but just something to, to really sort of note in your head and think, okay, if you're going to keep it long term, what are you going to be up against? And is it something that in the future, if you are thinking, okay, I want to keep it for nine years and then sell it on because it might be worth something, then it might be better looking at the petrol models. That's what I'm saying on this one. If you're thinking of keeping it for nine years, running it and then you're comfortable with the idea that it may not have much value then great you know the people that run these engines to 300,000 miles that's sort of half a, a million kilometers and then you know they'll sell it on to the next person who will run it as long as they can and these things keep going but there is a step change where hybrids start to come in the amg models start to switch to um, again smaller engines the uh, the smaller amg engine it's the a Sorry, the, the e, um, E55 or E43, but the, the smaller sort of 3, three litre V6 uh, AMG version comes in. That is actually, I know a lot of people are critical of the smaller AMG model um, or the smaller engine one, but I think it, it does quite a lot. It, it's, I know in this uh, era it actually replaces, I think you have the, the E400 and then it gets replaced by the AMG model, but the lower spec AMG model. And actually, you basically get a bit nicer styling, yeah, a bit nicer engine cover, rarity, and when you're driving down the road, you've, you've got an AMG model. Okay, it's not the big 63, it's not the big, you know, who are, but it's still something that, that looks quite respectable, goes respectably. You know, as we've moved through these generations, speed has been increasing over and over and over through the generations and it's like this almost doubling each time to the point where uh, when we get to these later generations you don't need an amg model you don't need one honestly it'll be difficult for you to find places that you can really use the power unless you live somewhere where your license isn't at such risk or you aren't 
be worried about the rules but if you are and you live in built up areas um, and you regularly drive around built up areas you'll get to enjoy the noise but um, with this generation also stepping into more emissions controls being fitted to engines they do get muted a little bit as well so some of the petrol um, sort of v6 engines that are in the regular spec you can get quite nice models of those you can get them quite well specified as well and on the used market they are really really good deals especially if you're willing to consider the hybrid because at the time here um, so the hybrid sort of tries to mix this efficiency uh, with um, with fuel economy with performance and it meant that the only people really buying them were sort of the three-year lease the first time round. then mercedes really needed to get them out of the, the uh, showrooms people weren't so sure of them so they usually got a good deal and now six years down the road seven years down the road they can be had for quite a deal because most of the owners that bought them bought them at a deal so just something to keep in mind last up w114 w214 <laughs> i should have got that better and so before i continue sorry the, the one thing I, I forgot to mention it here uh the 63 on the um on the w1213 generation that gets the four liter v8 that is fitted to the aston martin uh, vantage so um I, i'm wondering actually if it goes in the db11 no i don't think it does i think that sticks with a v12 the but the v8 definitely goes in the vantage so if you want to have say a mercedes wagon right that you put your family in and turn to your partner and say you know i have an aston martin engine Turn to your friends at the pub. Oh, I've got the Aston Martin engine outside. Now, it's actually a Mercedes engine that they, uh, that Aston Martin put in their cars. But all the same, Aston Martin pulls up next to you. Lift the bonnet. Lift the bonnet on yours. Hey, hey. Twins. Um, so, yeah, sticking, sticking on to this generation. Diesel, it's difficult here. Most of you won't have the 3 litre diesel anymore. Some of you will. It will be a 450D. The, the, the two litre one has really moved on performance wise however you do have the emissions uh, equipment side to consider especially because you'll be buying a one two year old car three year old car at this point they are mild hybrid you can buy them as plug-in hybrid i'd actually go for a plug-in hybrid if i wanted a diesel with a two litre engine because the fuel efficiency you know if you are saving such colossal amounts on, on amounts on fuel if someone then says to you oh we you know you need to do this repair it doesn't hurt quite as much because you know every time you know you fill it with a charge and fill it with a diesel tank you're not going to be visiting a fuel stop anytime soon so there is that to consider if it's petrol which is where i would lean if we step back a couple of generations and you look at the v6s when you get to this generation you can have a two liter inline engine with mild hybrid and the performance if you ran them in a straight line marginal difference between them so if you want something that is going to feel quick, feel like it belongs in a Mercedes, you can go for the smaller engine than these. You don't have to go for like the 450 um, hybrids that pair it up and, and you know really whoosh it down the road. So just a little bit of a buying tip. I think it's that thing of you can go for smaller engines. It, historically, especially when I sold cars, people wouldn't really consider the smaller engine uh, in larger vehicles. It just it didn't sound right now we've moved on small engines they're so powerful they deliver so much torque you're, you're probably not going to be too bothered if you're buying an e-class about noise unless you're up at the amg end of it so they're silenced anyway because a lot of them have all the different types of emissions equipment through the exhaust system so i would i would look at the smaller engines and if there is a deal going on them it could be a good buy just make sure you get a bit of a nice specification because mercedes are going through that time of they're trying to appeal to a broad market and it has become more and more difficult over the years as more competitors are around offering more choice and trying to get those same customers on a smaller variation to try and keep costs down it does create a little bit of a challenge and sometimes you have to sort of put out brand new cars on very low lease payments but they don't come with the specification so just check that one that is the e-class through the generations that has taken a lot of memory and several takes for me to get it so i hope you've enjoyed it if you have considered liking consider subscribing i shall see you in the next one